There we go. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it might be where you are out there. Welcome back to the live stream. My name is Jeff Fritz, and this is C Sharp with C Sharp Fritz. We're going to be learning about, about C Sharp programming language, about some .NET frameworks, and we're going to be building, we're going to actually be learning a little bit today about um, a design pattern and, and testing. I had a question come through asking, hey, can you cover a little bit more about testing? So we're going to talk a little bit more about unit testing and some patterns today. My apologies, I wasn't able to, this is my first day back, uh, back at work this week. I didn't get the YouTube configuration set up right before we got started, so this will be available on the YouTube uh, as a YouTube recording. We're not live streaming out to YouTube right now. That's okay. We'll get that all set up and ready to go uh, for next time. We'll be back online with that. So how are we doing there, chat room? Let me say hello to the chat room. They're right over here. How's it going there? Char Shy Sharp is here. Bob Ross RTX. Good to see you. Arshia. Hello, hello. Uh, CTI Geek. Good morning to you in Virginia. Charles Galuli. Good morning. Bob Ross. It's good afternoon in the UK. Oh, my goodness. I hope you're having a great Monday even after a little bit of disappointment yesterday. Um, it, my goodness, I, I, I have such a, I, I have such a problem when, when, when athletic competitions, when sports, when, when the finals of major competitions get down to the very end and, and it ends up going to a shootout. It ends up going to something that isn't inherently showing the skill of the players and they have to go to the, this modified, uh, not the same as what you were doing for the last 60 minutes, 90 minutes um, of a match. And it's, it's, it's not quite the same. It's not as, uh, um, uh, it, it's not the same experience. It doesn't feel very fulfilling when you have that change. And in, in hockey here in the States, when we saw them bring in the shootout, exciting, but not, not fulfilling. It, gosh, we're not seeing, how the players play the game anymore. It's, it's clearly, it's competition of only two people skill to decide a match. And it's, it's a little underwhelming to me. So, so this is my first episode back. So I, I didn't have a lot really scrolled out and planned, um, as far as where to go, new, new content to teach, but I did want to answer this question around unit testing. Unit testing is something that I do a bit of, um, and I'm very familiar with, and I wanted to go through and show a little bit about applying unit testing and design models to the project we left off with a few weeks ago, where we built a, we built a very simple calculator using windows forms. I want to dive back in there and talk about adding, adding unit test hooks, refactoring for testability, how we can take advantage of some design patterns. In particular, there's a design pattern that I like to use with Windows Forms called Model View Presenter. I also used this pattern years and years ago with Web Forms, ASP.NET Web Forms. Uh, some folks take a specialized version of this pat design pattern called Model View View Model, and they'll use that as well. Always open to answering questions here. The the uh, AMA tag is on. You can ask questions here. Um, just had a question on season one with commenting uh, on episode two. Sure, what do you have, Arshia? Uh, go ahead and you can ask a question. We can back up and take a look at any topic and uh, and discuss further as we want to get into the session today. Always, it, it's, it's particularly for this stream, um, it's much more important to answer your questions, to have these discussions, to make sure that folks that are just starting their C-sharp journey feel comfortable, that they are learning about the technology and they're enjoying what they're seeing here. So uh, let me know what, what, what questions you might have. I'm happy to pause and take a look at that. Um, oh, Curious Drive. It, see, getting right into some, some deep questions here. N design patterns aren't entirely my thing, but we can discuss. What's the difference between model view, view model, and model view update? So the way I understand it, the way that I see this, and we're going to get to, let me get to Arshia's question after this. The way that I see this model view, view model, you have three objects that you're working with, a model, 
a view and the view model object. So you typically have three different objects that you're working with, and they're working in concert with each other. A, a model that is housing the data that we're going to present, we're going to interact with. So that's our, our data container. Our view, that's how we're presenting. That's a, a very dumb piece of code that all it does is display the contents that we want to show. And the view model takes feedback from the view and handles some events like button presses or, or drop, down, uh, but drop down box selections, turns those events into actions from the view pro and decides what to do with them, hands interactions off to the model where model view update, there's only a model and a view. And the model knows how to handle all of its interactions and the view knows how to update and change its presentation and they work together. That's what I understand model view update to be. I haven't worked with it specifically. There's some coming interactions here with a, uh, with a framework that's going to better support model view update MVU. It's, it, it's not something that I have expertise in, but I definitely want to spend some more time practicing and learning about. That's the way I understand the two to be. I could be wrong on model view update, though, because I haven't done it yet. Orshi has a question here about... There's a parameter... Parameter... Easy for me to say. Parameter list constructor that made is enrolled to true way back in episode two of our first season. Um... That isn't working for our Shia. So tell you what, I'm going to get some, I'll get the music playing here in the background. Let me bring up and we can go back and take a look at that, uh, that notebook and we can learn more about that. I'm opening my browser right here and we're going to get some music playing. This is Stream Beats from Harris Heller and this is the Synthwave playlist. This is some groovy music that's just cool to listen to, easy on the ears, DMCA free, royalty free. You can listen to it wherever you'd like. Uh, Twitch, YouTube, Facebook, doesn't matter. Check it out, streambeats.com. There's playlists for all the major music services. Uh, thank you so much, Harris, for letting us listen to your music today. So I have the, uh, the notebooks opening over here. We'll take a look at this. There we go. It's opening up right here. Parameter list constructor in notebook two to set is enrolled. So way back when we were doing this, we had, um, and, and we're going to get back into the basics. There's going to be another basics of C sharp season that we're going to get into here. There it is. There we go. So this is building a container and launching it for us on binder is the name of the service that we're using here. So, uh, the notebook was updated during the session, so you won't find it unless on YouTube. All right. Launching the server and come on, show it to me. Let me get my gunners on here. It makes me feel comfortable looking at the screens for a long period of time. Uh, let's go. I want to see it. There it is. So way back in episode two, there was a, con a parameter list constructor. So we have students here and we have students that are created. So I'll just execute this code. Control enter will execute the code. It's going to start up. There we go. So I have Mary Contrary and I have Codex, NFG Codex is our other person here. So, and I want to change that out to a more generic name in this notebook. Um, so let's talk about parameterless constructor starting and defaulting to is enabled, uh, I'm sorry, is enrolled. This is a student object that has a first name, a last name, an age, and is enrolled. Now a Boolean by default has a false value. So if we don't set the is enrolled, I'm going to get rid of codex here. Um, 
if we don't set is enrolled here, so I'll just comment that out and we run this. Is enrolled defaults to false. See that? Because Boolean is a, a, by default false. So how do we default it to true with a parameterless constructor? You can set an initializer for a property like here to force it to default to true instead of the parameterless constructor defaulting it. So now it defaults to true. When we create a new instance of our student, it has this default value. And I, I can set default values for other things, right? I can say, well, the default value for the age of our students is 10 years old. By default, the students that are brand new to our school are 10 years old. Um, and there, there it goes. So I made a student class with parameter list and another constructor with parameters, but if I put is enrolled true, it returns false. So if we start up up here and we say uh, is enrolled equals true, I can also initialize it up there and it, it sets it to true. Um, and I did something in the YouTube video where it returns false. Well, right, the, the default codex down here was initializing is enrolled, right? So if we, if we force the value with, by setting up a property here after we create, then it will force it to that value. So, um, now there is a, the ability to overload for sure. There's the ability to overload. Um, so if we don't have is enrolled set here, um, and if we default and say up here is enrolled equals true. We can also create a student here with first name, uh, last name, and we can have it fail over and say, also execute the other constructor. And I can say first name equals, let's make this a little bit clearer. This dot first name equals first name, this dot last name equals last name and it will take these values and assign it to the property and overload and set that so now uh oh shoot i can't just comment that stuff out um so that still gives me mary contrary and by default is enroll true up here so let's get rid of that bring it down here. So Mary contrary is false, but I can also, uh, shoot, I jumped ahead. I can also create, um, right? So let's create F equals a uh, new student, um, Jeff Fritz. And now if I say display F, now is enrolled defaults to true because it it's coming through this configuration and setting it and which will trigger the other constructor up here which sets it to true so i set it to true why is it false now um I need to see a little bit more about the state of what you're looking at so I can pull that apart. Can you take a screenshot and and share a link to your screenshot? Take a screenshot, post it somewhere so we can take a look at the context. Um, screenshot, you won't be able to copy an entire block of code into chat. Uh, okay, and we can pull that apart and make sure that that we understand where you're going. Um, 
You have to go back to work, but super interesting stuff. You're a beginner with C Sharp. It's really nice to see working hard to teach C Sharp to others. Look forward to catching more streams. Thank you, Black Mage. I appreciate that. Um, we're, and we're going to get into w, WPF next week. Um, one more week after that, we'll do WPF on the 26th. And we're going to get back into... I think we're going to get back into C Sharp in August. I think that's where we're going to go. Um, links are disabled in this channel. I can... I can turn them back on briefly here. Uh, hyperlinks are turned on. You can you can post hyperlinks. So, um, Arv, uh, oh, hmm. is that uh, Ralvarador? Ralvarador asks. Uh, so using this, it's like the word instruction super in Java. Um, super lets you reach into the base object of things. Um, so super in Java, right? Is that, isn't that what that does? Um, this is saying call the other constructor without parameters. Um, right? Isn't super, right? Uh, Java super keyword. Let me remember my my Java. Yeah, super refers to parent class methods, and without parens, yes, refers to the constructor. Okay, yes. Um, so it is allowing me to refer to. I can also refer to the base object if there's a base constructor. I can refer to it like that. But I'm referring to the parameterless constructor in this same um, student class. So you see down here in with Joe Bag of Donuts um, has this this overloading starting to happen, where I'm starting to set some of these values. Um, wow, the telephone spammers are starting early today. Um, Serge Dev asks, does the parameter list constructor overload the parameter is enrolled true, which was instanced true before? Um, so let me come back up here. Does it overload? Well, no, it doesn't overload. It, overload is, is not using correctly here. Um, the parameter list constructor, when you go through there, it isn't setting that value, so it's going to output as false. So Mary Contrary, who's created without that, runs through to false. Um, so that's why that value is is coming out of this. Um, if is enrolled is set up in here then any student that's created and you don't set is enrolled explicitly gets salt set to true so a couple different ways to to come through and do this and of course right if we default it by setting it right here right we we initialize is enrolled to true Doesn't, I don't have to initialize or set it anywhere. It's just always true without any interaction. I specifically, I have to explicitly go through and set that value to false. Um, Mr. Noted, you're right. Having a default value eliminates unambiguous possibilities. Is the student auto-enrolled or is some action create the enrollment? Very good point. In, in my student management system here, if you're creating a student, by default, the student is enrolled. There's some, at, right, I, I don't care about, about folks that are just wandering around out there that aren't students in, in my school. 
once they enroll in my school, once they, once they communicate and they start interacting with me, then they become a student and a student by default is enrolled. In order for a student to depart, right? A student graduates, a student leaves school for whatever reason. At that point, that action of graduation or, or leaving school, abandoning school, would flip the is enrolled property to false. I right, I great, you know, hey, there's there's Joe Bag of Donuts out there walking the street. I'm not gonna create a student record for Joe Bag of Donuts because they're not enrolled in my school. They're not a they're not a student, so why would I create a student object? So things to understand and manage and if you write this is if you don't need it don't build it so by default it makes sense that we're going to create students that are enrolled and right maybe it makes sense to have some sort of a method right maybe maybe this is protected and we have some sort of a method um for them to graduate and when they graduate is enrolled equals false right so by default new students are enrolled and jeff fritz graduated and jeff fritz forgot to type a semicolon and jeff fritz is no longer enrolled Different ways to manage data types and designing and deciding when and how to do those interactions. Benny has a question here. Not out of scope. AMA is turned on. Always happy to answer questions. We're already stepping a little bit outside of the topic for today, and that's okay. I want to make sure I answer your questions. Um, do I consider... Would I consider doing a stream around design patterns in C-sharp, strategy, factory, mediator um this is a little bit more advanced than what i like to cover in these sessions i really like to prefer to cover the basics of using the frameworks testing is very much an important pattern that folks use an important technique that we use i have done sessions on continuous integration i have done session it deleted the link no i've got it here i've got it arshia I've got it. Hey, I know that guy. I got the link. You're good. This was happening to me last night. I was putting a link. I was sharing a link on another stream and it would delete the link for me, but other folks were able to see it. That's messed up. That's pretty weird right there. Um, okay. So I will show that in just a second, but I, let me, to finish... And, and we'll take a look at finishing Arshia's question here. But to Benny, I, I have covered some other um, design patterns. MVC we covered, of course, with ASP.NET MVC. With some of those, I've, I've shown a little bit of repository pattern. Um, I, would, I would look at bringing somebody else in to help discuss and go into design patterns. There's many different ways that we can go with these. Uh, many different directions we can go to with these. Let's let's um, let me put a pin in that topic. That might be something that, that would be interesting to come back to and and show a couple of the design patterns um, as a little bit more of an advanced topic. I do want to get into before we get back to the basics of C sharp. I do want to get into an advanced session talking about attributes talking uh, about uh, analyzers. I'm going to talk about building analyzers and code fixers. Those three topics that I think are very interesting for advanced C-sharp developers because now you, you get into writing code that writes code for you, that checks your code and reports back information about your code. So I think we'll take a look at that Maybe maybe we do that for end of July. So if we do WPF next week, maybe for the 26th, I'll do that kind of... And I'm, I'm just scratching the surface on WPF. 
Uh, maybe for the 26th, we'll do... We'll do analyzers and code fixers. Yeah, let's do that. Um, okay, so here, I have uh, the image captured from YouTube. So here, Arshia is asking... Um, ah. Okay. So... Um, oh my gosh, you are too kind, Arshia. Thank you so much. So the question here is, why is it when we create a student here where we specify the age, why didn't the enrolled get set? So let me let me reset here. So, uh, so if we go up here, I'm going to get rid of this. And if we say, and there's already the correct answer in, in chat. So if we say, is enrolled equals true when we just create a student, right? So now when that runs, let me get rid of this call. Now all of my students are enrolled by default because I have is enrolled equals true. But what I had done there in the sample was I had created a second constructor here where I could specify the age and I would say this dot age equals the age. So now if when I create my new student here, right, um, I'm going to create a new student who's 30 years old. They're going back to, they're going back to class. Um, first name equals Jeff. Um, last name equals Fritz. And I'm using initializers there. So now is enrolled equals false. Why did it, why did it get set to false? So what's happening because I'm using, when I create the Mary Contrary student up here and I use this constructor, it enters the student through this method because it has the same signature. It doesn't have any arguments. So this executes this method, this constructor. When I created the new student for Jeff Fritz, I created it with a different constructor, specifying age of 30 which means it's entering this way. It's only executing this method, so it never sets is enrolled to true. And I kind of solve this problem by doing this cascading of my constructor by, in this second, this third constructor, by calling this parentheses here. So if I do that, it says execute this method then execute this method. So I could come up here and say, display is enrolled. And it, it, it ran in, it ran in exactly the opposite order that I thought it did. I, th this is, uh, even I confuse this, the, the order that this happens. So I created a new student, 30, called Jeff Fritz. It goes into this method. Instead of it going through and calling the age and, and executing this, it first went and executed that. And came back and executed these, okay? So it walks into the other constructor, executes all of those things first. Come on, highlight it right, Fritz. And executes these. And you can see that because when it displayed is enrolled from inside my constructor, it was set to true. It, it had finished the other constructor. You get it, fantastic. So, uh, Galdudis asks, display is the same as console right line? In Jupyter Notebooks it is, yes. It, it serves the same purpose. So, and right, there's all kinds of tricky things you can do with constructors, bouncing back and forth between different, different signatures. So you're not writing the same code every time and you can ensure the same properties, the same configuration is applied to all of your classes as you work with them. 
right. Um, Galdudas has a question here. Um, let me back up to that. And I'm going to go back over to the chat room over here. Asking, do I have access to the beta of the GitHub Copilot? I do. Um, in fact, uh, all the members of the live coders have access to it. Um, as well as many Microsoft employees. Um, really neat what they're doing with it. Um, definitely need some tuning. The interactions with it are, uh, they can be a little overwhelming because when I'm, when I'm writing code, it all of a sudden wants to finish a whole bunch of other stuff that I'm, I haven't necessarily thought through yet. So now where my thought process would be here, I'm typing, I'm thinking things through. All of a sudden there's this suggestion that I haven't thought through yet. So there's something there that we need to, I need to learn how to reconcile. I, I think there's a little bit of a collision with some of the other tooling inside of Visual Studio Code where it gets a little bit tricky to to continue using regular IntelliSense or IntelliCode because as you start typing code, Copilot comes in and just blows away anything else you were writing and says, I know what you meant, and lays out all this code. And that can be a little daunting. That can be a little overwhelming. So really neat tool. It is in beta. We're going to see them iron out some of the issues with it. I think it's going to be a very important tool and tools like it. I think it's one of the first of this next generation. There's other tools folks have written to analyze and suggest code. Um, but I think we're, we're going to see a very interesting path forward with the ability to, to meta develop where we're not so much writing code as we're saying, here's what I want it to do. And some generator generates more of this for us. So Yes, the solid principles and the O, oh, open for extension, closed for modification. Yes. So. All right. Hey, Sam. Good day to you. Hope you're having a, a fantastic evening there in Australia. Um, all right. I wanted to get into talking a little bit more about design patterns for unit testing. And I wanted to pick up from the calculator sample that we had last time and talk about bringing the model view presenter pattern or even model view view model pattern. They're, they're very similar um, into that code and, and how that can set us up for unit testing because by default, uh, Windows Forms a little bit tricky to unit test. How do we test that? How do we actually go and click a button to do a thing? So, Let's talk about that. Let's get into that. Let's. I'm going to head over to the other set. Uh, it's it's right back there. You can see my laptop over there. And we can get into this. And uh, next week we'll talk. We'll we'll talk about WPF. And the week after that, we'll get into that final advanced topic. I think that that I wanted to cover. Yeah. Um, analyzers and code fixers for C sharp. Because this is. This is like linting for JavaScript at a whole nother level. Um, so let's do it. All right. So I'm going to grab my coffee. I'm going to grab my phone in case there's any messages that come. And we're going to switch microphones. There we go. I think that's better. Uh, let me head over to the other scene and I'll be right. Well, hang on. Grab the, grab the chat. Move that up. And you know what? I'm realizing I don't have my mouse over there, do I? Do I have my mouse? I think I put it... I might have put it on the floor when I was... I was sorting th I was sorting through uh, things on the table, and I forgot to move things around. No matter. We'll head over there, and we'll get things started. Here we go. Da -da -da -da. Right? I, yeah, I don't have my second mouse over here for the other machine. There's GitHub. Uh, Copilot is off to a pretty cool start. It is. Ah, there it is. I knew I put it down here. 
Right, where's my mouse? Good, good, good. I do have the mouse. So I, I have my mouse run on a uh, wireless mouse so I can still get back to the chat room and interact with you over here. So this is, um, of course, our GitHub repository. This is the list of projects we have, and we're right down to the end. Um, I wanted to do a second unit testing stream. I wanted to talk about attributes. We did talk about null references features. Um, async await and tasks. Maybe we can get into that next time as well at the end of the month. Um, but we're going to do this unit testing, a little bit of unit testing here with Windows Forms and attributes we'll do way at the end of the month. Okay. So github.com slash C sharp Fritz slash uh, C sharp with C sharp Fritz. And we'll go back and, and we're, we're going to loop back over our sessions here that we did uh, last year tuning, improving. We're even going to get into C Sharp 10 as we get into November. We're going to bring .NET MAUI into the discussion a little bit later this year and uh, tune and improve. And this is just going to be an ongoing cycle of learning and, and remembering that we're going to be doing as we continue through these sessions. That coffee is hot. Oh my gosh. That coffee is hot. Really? Really? You're gonna you're gonna try and pull this? Um Oh, no, that was someone else. Hmm. Okay. Let's do this. So last time we were We were building a calculator. We built a very simple calculator. Um let me grab that source code, and I'm, I'm actually just going to dupe it here. See, look, I even I put it in the wrong place. Um, <laughs> can I... Let me go back to main, pull those changes. Thank you. Um, no. Uh-huh. Thank you. All right. No, you're not going to show it to me, are you? Fine. Be that way. Be that way. Um, so I'm going to create a new folder here. I'm going to call this 0502 WinForms Patterns and Testing. And I'll paste my app into there. Uh, no. Thank you. Let's create a solution file. Uh, you can't see it down here. My apologies. .NET new SLN. And I have a solution file now. Um, .NET SLN. I'm going to add my app to it. I'm going to create a unit test project to go with this. Um, before I do that, let me take a quick look at the project file here. My project file is .NET 6. That's fine. So let's create a unit test project that we're going to work with here. .NET new X unit. And I'm just going to call it test. Framework is going to be net 6.0, not 6, 6.0 dash windows. Ah, uh, you. That's fine. Since it's a windows Windows Forms project, we need to create it with the Windows, uh, the win the dash Windows uh, sub sub framework, so that it knows this is Windows only. So I really hate how far over this this goes over here, because right now it's like uh, you're looking over here. Um, so let's see here. Um, uh, um, I could run Visual Studio Code right here. Let's do that. Let's do this development with Visual Studio Code. Yeah, why not? Why not? Let's break all the rules. Building with Windows Forms with Visual Studio Code. Um, because I can. So there's my projects over there. Now my test project, I need to make, yes, I know, go, sure, you go ahead and do that. See, it's net 6.0 by default here. 
um, where my Windows Forms application is net60-windows. So I'm just going to make my test project the same version of that target framework so that it runs on Windows. And uh, open this back up. There it goes. Um, so let's go into, what do we have, right? Yeah. And um, I'm going to .NET add reference to my app. So now my test project has a reference to my application. Okay. And my application, right, has this wonderful, um, let's do this. And I'm going to shrink that a little bit, move this over. Uh -huh. And inside here, let's go into my app. And it's hiding over here. I'm just going to .NET run it. And this is going to finish running. There it is. And there's my very simple calculator with the numbers in the wrong positions. It doesn't look like a numeric keypad. It looks more like a phone. That's okay. You make your calculator how you want. Whatever. Um, some ways to earn money as a programmer. Build an application. Build a library. Build a tool that folks want to buy. And charge money for it. There you go. Build a website that folks want to visit. Put advertisements on it. There you go. Get a job working for a company that needs software developers. That'll get you started as well. So I've got this Fritz's wonderful calculator that we built here some time ago. And it, it lets me do things here, right? I can add three and three and I get six. Yay. Right? These types of things, right? Multiply times six and gosh that that didn't work at all um 66 times six see it, it, that that's not working i don't have a reliable clear button any of these types of things so let's write some tests let's refactor this a little bit so that we can interact with our calculator we can verify that it behaves the way it should with some unit tests Build a game. There's another good way. Absolutely. A game's just a, it is just another piece of software that you can sell. So, um, compiling C-sharp to WebAssembly, check out Blazor. And how we do stuff over there with Blazor. All right. Um, so, I want to introduce the model view presenter pattern inside my project. Now... I could do this by introducing another library and actually putting everything over there. That's not a bad idea. It's, it's not entirely a bad idea. So let me do this. Over here, I'm going to go up. Let's uh, create a new class library. And I'm going to call this myapp.core. Um, right? Uh, I forgot the dash O myapp.core okay so now I have my my project that I'm gonna put all my business logic in all of the the guts of how my application works let me go into the test project and I will uh, .NET add reference to myapp.core I'm gonna do the exact same thing in my app add a reference to that there as well okay so now everything knows about my app.core and what I'm going to do is I'm going to define the pieces necessary to run a calculator inside here now there's there's different parts to this architecture right we think about model view presenter we have a model that's the data that we're interacting with the view, that's the user interface that we interact with. And the presenter, that's what pulls those two pieces. The data we're interacting with and 
the user interface pulls those together and defines the business logic of how the view updates the model and how the model gets painted onto the view so that's how we're going to work with these um yes yeah, c sharp is a, a garbage collected language just like java just like c plus plus c plus plus has garbage collection now as well so one class per file that's right so why do we need a class library that's a great question arshia um and why do we need a class library the class library lets us refer to those classes from other projects multiple other projects directly instead of having to reference and load up that one main project so let's take a look at this um i can actually let me go back into my app i can actually refer not my app uh into test let me remove the reference to that project okay i thought i just deleted that um that there we go all right so i'm going to create and i'm going to define how I interact with with this calculator object. So I've got some sort of a model, and just for the purposes of making this easy to follow, I'm gonna call this model. And it has uh, some sort of a value, a current value that we're working with. So I'm gonna call that a decimal current value, and it's got those properties. Uh, the ability to get and set it and you can't see it because it's hiding here behind me there we go get and set now that's fine i also have i have a buffer that i can interact with right because when you when you start punching numbers on your calculator right you you start typing five plus well it takes that five and it puts it into memory somewhere so that it can bring it back later and interact with it that buffer actually, I, I think, belongs more with our presenter, where the business logic is taking place. So I also have a view, right? So I'm going to create an interface for that, and I'm going to call it I Calculator View. Now remember from our discussion on interfaces, interfaces define a contract for how a class is going to interact with the rest of the application. So I'm going to define a view here that knows how to how to present the value that's been being interacted with here. So let's uh, create a string and this is our screen display. Okay. And so we have a get and set on that. Now I'm going to move this to another file. Uh, there we go. And I'm going to rename this file to model. Okay. So I've got this ability to have a display. I have the ability to show the values. Now I need to put together the various interactions that we can have with our view. I can press buttons that, that do things so what happens when those when when those number buttons are pressed when those operator buttons are pressed how do we interact with them so that's something that we're going to start providing for um and let me just think for a second if i do this I don't want to do expose the button object specifically. No, uh, I want to have, this is a very simple view, very simple model. Um, when, a, when a button is pressed, though, I want, to, I want to trigger some sort of an interaction with my model that comes from the view. So, and we need to update the display in the view. So we need to put together a presenter. And I will call this presenter. 
Now, the presenter knows how to interact with all of our objects. In fact, we're going to create our presenter and pass into it our model. Uh, no, we're going to create it and pass into it our view. It's going to know how to go get the the model itself. Sometimes you, I set up the presenter so it receives a repository, so it knows how to interact with a database. In this case, I'm not talking about database. I'm doing very simple, so we'll interact with our model. I'll write it uh, locally here. So I'll use my constructor. Uh, that's the constructor snippet, that C-T-O-R tab, and it generates a constructor here for me. So I'll tab over the parameters I want to receive are an I calculator view, and you'll see why we're using this in just a second. I'm gonna store a copy of that. Okay, let me be explicit. And I'm gonna create a read-only field called I calculator view, uh, called underscore view for my calculator view. So now I know what it is and where it is going to be placed. Now, I'm going to start wiring this up to the form directly so you can see how this view comes into play and then how we're going to build our tests around this so we can test exactly how this form works. So I'm going to take this and make it an I calculator view. See that? And generate the appropriate using statement. And now it's saying, I've got a red line here that says... Oh, you haven't implemented the features of the view. It has a, a screen display. We don't know what that is. So I'm going to implement that interface. Now, of course, this is a property with get and set here. And typically throughout this, this series, I've been generating properties with just get set with an automatic value that we're storing in memory behind the scenes. Now it's time to have this get and set with something somewhere else. Let's introduce some other business logic that'll actually get and set the screen display with where the screen is actually displayed. So here we go. Instead of getting, throwing a not implemented exception, my screen is actually a text box right here. And I can interact with the text property of it to set things on this display properly. So if I want to get the value of what's on my screen display, I can just return the text value. And when I want to set the value, right, I can say calculator screen text equals the value that we're setting. So now, now we're starting to abstract and move things away from interacting here, live inside my Windows form. I've just set up this little bit of indirection here, we call it, because I'm, I'm not going to work with this box. I'm gonna work with the screen display so that I can say, screen display, set this value. Get this value from the screen display and do something with it. Let's continue. So I have this number button click method here that goes and does something with it. What I'd like to do is pass this off somewhere else so that it knows what to do with those number buttons. And then we can go and test out what it is. So really, what we'd like to do is do something like, um, say, number button pressed and pass into it the text that was on the button. Button dot, te uh, and button is sender. So, right, I, gosh, I'd really like to do something like that. Right? So that I'm passing that somewhere else and I can then inspect and put this logic somewhere where I can test it and verify that 
in the right state, it's doing things properly. Um, 3D Polywraith asking a little bit further down here, thinking through the the configuration a little bit here. Would you want to set it up with the value? It set it up. Set up that value is only set if source is different from value. I'm not quite sure what you mean. Let's let's continue here, and I'll, I'll show you a, a little bit of, and we'll talk through some of the other logic, and then we'll be able to write some tests to validate that logic. I don't know where this is going to run yet, but it's going to run somewhere. And here's my operators, right? For the various operator buttons. And I've got all this business logic for how to run all of these mathematical operations. So this, this is too much for a form to be doing. There's too much thinking here for my form. I don't... When you're doing this much thinking right processing and deciding inside of a form first off it's in your user interface which doesn't make it too testable it's not something i can repeat and test it's getting confusing here and it's very much coupled to my user interface instead of to other programmatic constructs that i can reach into and interact with so let's move this out as well i'd, I'd like to move it somewhere where i can I can call uh, operation uh, operator button click and um, right. I I, I want to figure out what this operation is. Right, operation is something here. So I'm gonna do something like that. I don't know what it is yet. I do know what it is, but. We're going to see how we move this and make this testable in just a second. But these two methods are the methods that we want to call inside of our presenter object. So after I initialize component up here, um, I'm going to say presenter equals new presenter, and I'm going to pass in this. And let's create that as a read-only field up there, okay? Now, operation and buffer, don't know what they are just yet. Um, right? Yeah. Uh, I don't, oh, I didn't set the operation anywhere else. That's fine. Okay. Um, I only wired up plus. Okay. So what I want now, so I have a presenter. My presenter is going to know how to do these interactions. And my presenter is a class over here that can be unit tested. So I'm moving all of my logic out of my form so that my form is going to be just these two method calls. That becomes easier to work with. So let's change this so this calls I just saw the cat. No. <laughs> is the cat in here? Last thing I want is cat to be running around underfoot. Um, underscore presenter, number button pressed. So let's go and generate that method. And I'm going to take this. Pull it out of here. I don't need that anymore. And I'll go to this, right? So there's number button pressed and I'm receiving the text, right? The, the text of uh, the number button value, but it's a string. I need to do something with that. Okay. So what do I do? Um, well, instead of button dot text, right? Uh, I could just push this onto the screen like this and calculator screen text is now actually underscore view dot screen display. OK. 
Okay. So now, now I can test that when you press a number button, what does it set the display value to in my calculator? Now I have a way to inspect those and see when you press buttons, number buttons, what does it do to the display? And there's my very simple logic for how it updates the display. Um, we need a service manager then. <laughs> in larger applications, you sure do. You sure do in larger applications, Peter. But uh, for something this simple, no. No. Um, Arshia, that's correct. Control dot makes suggestions available. Yes. As you're, as you're typing in, in Visual Studio, uh, in other code editors, Visual Studio Code and others, as you're typing here, I can hit Control Space, uh, Karnak. Um, I can type Control Space, and why is it on that corner? That's, hang on, Karnak's in the wrong place. You. Up there. And now Karnak's not running at all. It crashed. Nice. Try that one more time. I thought I had Karnak working properly on this machine. Here. No, it's putting it in the wrong location and crashing when I try to save. Yeah. Nope, not gonna work for me. Um, okay. I'll put on screencast mode. So control space will open this up. Control dot. That's uh -huh. Let me get into... Really? Yes, there we go. Because that is way too much stuff there only keyboard shortcuts please so right when I control space it'll do the autocomplete for me but you can also have it give you suggestions in Visual Studio in Visual Studio Code Visual Studio for Mac um, I think Rider and some of the other editors do this also um, where you can do control period and it will give you code actions to take. So if I go back over here to form one, right? I've, I have all these dimmed out using statements. If I control dot, it gives me a suggestion, hey, let's remove those unnecessary usings. And it simplifies. Now, not entirely necessary to remove those. At compile time, they'll get removed. Uh, so it's not a performance hit to have extra using statements. It just looks sloppy. It's it it looks it, yeah. It, it it looks like you you had a party and you didn't clean up from the night before. Know what I'm saying? So um, yeah, Karnak shows keyboard shortcuts, and for some reason, it isn't quite loading properly. Um, something like this to minimize property changed calls. Uh, oh yeah, you can do that. Absolutely, it does make for an angry linter. It's not. It's not considered couth to go into somebody's open source project and clean up their using statements and not provide any other suggestions. Like you're ad modifying a lot of lines of code without actually providing new functionality. I had somebody do that to one of my open source projects. It was, sent a pull request and it was they changed all the files, all the C sharp files in the project and all they did was go through and said format code and removed using statements and was like it was a lot of work for me to review that 
pull request, and there was no value given other than they said, format code. Like, I appreciate what you're doing, but I didn't really need that. So. Like, it's fine to clean up as you're delivering new functionality, but uh, our, our friend Steve Smith, he's a Microsoft MVP. Um, you can find him on Twitch. He's our Dallas. Uh, A-R-D-A-L-I-S. He's written a, a lot of the... Um, a lot of code, a lot of samples and documentation that you'll find on docsmicrosoft.com. Um, Steve refers to the Boy Scout rule. When you open and work with a line of code, a uh, uh, code file, leave it in better format, in better shape than when you found it. Don't go, and by that he means, don't go and clean up everything inside of a, a project. Only when you go in and work on a file clean it up a little bit, remove some some unnecessary comments, some old to-do methods in there that need to be removed, um, that are no longer valid, remove, remove excess using statements at that point, only when you're going in and updating it. So you've learned from your mistakes. No, it wasn't you. There was It was somebody else. That's right. Code contributor, code contributor versus a code made. We don't need a, a maid. We don't need a housekeeper coming through to clean up our code. That's something that we could actually have uh, tools automatically do for us. Let's be careful on how we do that. Yeah, or Dallas. A-R-D-A-L-I-S. Yep, Plural Site Courses. He's got a number of really good ones out there. So now my form is a calculator view, so I know how to interact with it. The buffer and the operation are going to end up getting moved out because I'm going to put my presenter over here to handle the operator button click interaction. And I'm going to control dot and it's going to tell me, hey, let, would you like me to generate that method for you? Don't mind if I do. And now there's a method in my presenter class for operator button click. So, and it's going to pass in what's the current operation. More on that in a minute. So let's grab this logic, right? That's a lot of logic there, ooh. And I'll go over to my presenter and I'm just gonna move it right here. There it is. So I'll just replace these. Now, calculator screen text, we know that is our view screen display, right? View screen display, same thing here. Because I'm hitting that level of indirection, right? This is just regular operation. And this is view screen display all right now I still have this buffer hanging out here I'm going to move the buffer from here into my presenter because I want all of those interactions to take place in the presenter so let's go over there and Right, that's that's a piece of business logic we need to remember. All right. Now, the operation I want to be passed in from the text of the button, our operator buttons. So I'm going to go back to my calculator view over here, and where this was being passed in from this operation value up here. I'm going to remove that, and instead, I'm going to pass in the current text, just like I did up here, for the button. So that I know, here's what, you, what I want to do, which means I need to change the signature of this. And I'm going to rename this. I'm going to press F2. And I can rename it everywhere. I'll rename it to Operator. And that 
goes through and renames all of my uh, my code. Now, it's testing against single quotes here because it was a character, right? Uh, do 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 do. Um, let's do this. Uh, oh, rats! Not all. Uh, no. No. Oh, wow. That wasn't what I expected. Nope. I was hoping to get the... Yeah. Oh, there it is. Alt-Shift. Check this out. Hold down Alt and hit Shift. And drag. Creates multiple cursors that you can start to type with. Um, I'll replace this. There we go. Okay. So I've effectively migrated everything. And we've passed in an operator here. And we need to decide and actually store what the last operator was so we know what to do with it when we press equals or something else. Alt, shift, and arrows also works. And that was actually copying things for me. Look at this, right? Alt, shift, down, and it's copying it down. Wasn't expecting that. So, okay. I've now moved all of my logic for my calculator. Look, right? I have a, a display that's being output. I have my number button click that hands off to the presenter. And I have my operator buttons that hand off to the presenter as well. At this point, this is where I and, and where I describe in a model view view model or in a model view presenter architecture, my view is dumb. It doesn't know how to do anything. It's handing everything off to some other object somewhere and says, you figure this out. I don't know what to do when a number button is clicked, you go figure this out, Mr. Presenter. Number button was pressed. I don't know what to do when button 13 is clicked. Hey, Mrs. Presenter, Ms. Presenter, um, here's the text of that button. Go figure it out. And now we can go and interact and put our tests against our presenter class and make sure that it behaves the way that we want our calculator to behave. Because right now, it's not behaving properly. We're, we're clearly seeing an issue in here. So let's write, let's write a unit test to test our calculator doing just two plus two equals four, right? Actually pressing the buttons two plus two equals and see what it puts on my screen display. <clears throat> so let's take a look. Let's write that first unit test. So I'm going to, I don't, I don't have to look at the form anymore. The form doesn't do anything. The form is dumb and we don't need it anymore. I don't need a view anymore either. So I'm going to go down into my test and I'm going to start here with test one and let's write our, our first test here and let's call this uh, sum uh, four, four and uh, no, sum <coughs> two and two. I'm not going to use in my the normal given when then architecture for this just because I want to get through and show some of these samples a little bit more, a um, little bit quicker than, than having to go through the whole thing. So I need to have a view that is going to provide that screen display. My view is just a it's just an interface. Now I could I could come down here and create a class stub view that implements I calculator view. Right? And why don't you know what that is? Why don't you know what that is? I thought I told you. Yeah, it knows what that is. Right? Uh, reload window. OK. 
Come on. You're not going to give me that. Come on. No. Still not going to give me it. Wow. Wow. That should fail. Yeah. That's what I thought. And Visual Studio Code isn't giving me that. All right, fine. Um, <laughs> I'll put the using statement in myself. You still not going to give me this? Nope. It should give me the ability to go and implement the interface. Fine. We'll roll over to full Visual Studio. If Visual Studio Code doesn't help me with this. So. Loading the project. Let me add the other two existing projects so we can see them all. Okay, so now they're all in my Solution Explorer. So I was in Unit Test. Thank you. See, now, oh, now you can't see. Hmm. Now it's got the red underline over here. Implement that interface. So I could create a little stub view here that I could inspect and work with. You can do that. There are frameworks that you can use out there that will allow you to fake, that will allow you to create these types of things, conjure them as you need, so that you can just say, well, give me one of those things and it'll just be there for you. Because of how simple this is and in, or in order to um, avoid going into some of those concepts around stubs and fakes, I'm not gonna bring in a, a fake, a, a uh, a, a dupe framework right now there's some great ones out there and I'm, tr I'm trying to remember the one that I use all the time because I, I just it's in the project and I don't create a new one anymore um, um, it is oh my gosh I I do this in the blazer web forms components it is really Fritz and it's good to have a large selection of uh, code out there that you can go through and mocks a mock framework is what I'm thinking of and it's uh, mock you M O yeah right this yeah M O Q is a framework that I typically use for this type of um, unit testing stub generation and it will create this and make it available to you but for the purposes of what we're doing since I only have the one thing I'm not gonna get into how to build and work with this so I just have a little screen display here that we're working with so some two and two we're testing the presenter so I need I'm gonna follow the uh, 3a configuration for how we build our unit tests. Arrange, act, and assert. So, arrange, act, and assert. Those are the three parts of all of our unit tests. So, arrange, um, I'm going to create a presenter and I'll call it, I'll call it SUT, the system under test, is what you'll see us name these. But, it, it's very English in orientation, but most coding is English, I guess. So system under test, in it's a new presenter, and the view that I'm passing into it is a new stub view that I have down below. So now I have my presenter. Let's act on it. So now I can say system under test, number button pressed. So what number button am I pressing? I'm pressing two, and then I'm gonna 
press an operator button and I'm gonna press, well, it's not just plus, is it, right? If I look at my form, it's plus slash equals, right? System under stress, that's S-U-S, that's sus. Uh, there you go, plus slash equals. So I, you know what, I could say, um, right, let's put it like that. That's the button that I'm pressing. And number button pressed is two again. And I'm going to press that same um, plus equals button to end things. And I want to assert, I'm gonna check, assert equal, and I'm gonna inspect my view. Let's actually put this up here. Um, oh, let me use that. Let me show you that that same control dot refactoring works up here also. So if I highlight stub view, control dot, introduce local. So it introduces a local variable called view. Um, good. And I'm going to put a var there just to make it a little bit shorter to read. So now I can say assert equal. What am I expecting? I'm expecting four because I just added two and two. That's what I expect to be on the screen and the actual, what am I actually inspecting here? Well, I'm going to inspect view dot screen display and see what it says. So I'll save that and I'll run dot net. I'll run dot net test here at the command line just so you can see that it works but I'll bring up the live unit testing inside Visual Studio. And you see, my refactoring didn't quite work. Expected four, but it got zero. Why did it get zero? Let's go back. So operator button clicked. When it, when, um, and I can actually add more assert equals in here so I can test it along the way. So if I go into here, operator button click helps if you, there we go. Right, so it inspects the operator. If it's empty space, the operator is plus. Otherwise, switch buffer plus current value is string. So what we need to do is we need to inspect, well, here's the button that was clicked and set, this is the current operation somewhere. And we had that previously but it moved. So um, I'll say uh, current operation, and that will be empty space. So now I can say if current operation is the empty space, then we're gonna default Current operation equals plus. Uh, no, we shouldn't say plus. Current operation equals, well, let's let's parse what was passed into us and we can figure that out. So let's say, um, let's start with operator. If it contains plus, then we'll make it plus. Otherwise, we'll say operator zero with character because it'll be the x it'll be the slash it'll be the minus the subtraction and that's what we'll put into our current operation so now it knows the current operation current value we're going to parse the screen display and instead we're going to pivot on current operation say now i these were right the first time All right. And after it's done operating, we'll reset the current operation to blank. So I'll run the test again. And it runs properly. Two plus two did report four on the screen. I didn't actually press the buttons, but I ran all the operations that the buttons do. 
So I've moved around. I know I'm, I'm using very large, uh, very large uh, text here so that we can see everything. And I know a lot of folks that are watching the stream uh, or the recording on YouTube are, are using their phones. So having large text like this is going to make it a lot easier for folks to be able to see what's going on. Production-wise, right, hard code, uh, hardcore development, I'm not using fonts this size. I'm, I'm doing this strictly for teaching. So, I mean, really, the font is as big as my head. <laughs> uh, but you're right, Marvin. Uh, only 14 lines of, of code at a time is not a lot. All right. Um, so now I know, right? And I can come back over to here and I can run my application and I know that even though it's using this new pattern, I can do two plus two and I get four. I have that assurance now that it works. But what about multiplication, right? Let's, right, if we do write a unit test for multiplication, make sure that that works, right? So I will um, cheat and copy. And let's make this uh, multi multiply three and three, right? And I could be using theories for this, I know. Um, maybe we'll look at that in a second, right? So I'm pressing three times three plus equals, and I expect it to show on the screen nine. Now let me do the unit, use the unit testing tools that are here inside Visual Studio. So if I go up to test, I can say run all tests, and it has this cool test runner here that'll run and show me the results of my tests right here. There you go, you see the little, the little uh, line going by status bar, and that works. And I can even pin this down here at the bottom of my screen so that I can see my tests are running and I can even get the error messages out of here and verify that things are working properly. Um, good. That's kind of what I ex these how I expect these things to work. So what happens if I go and act, put a third operation on the end of this, right? Um... Right, I did multiply three and three. Uh, I did sum two and two. So now let's add a third operation, right? Uh, add three numbers, right? So now let's do two plus equals three and four. Two plus three plus four should be nine. Let's make sure that works. Now, I haven't even saved the file yet, and look at this down here. It knows there's three tests. Not only that, it's showing, hey, I haven't run this test yet. I've recognized it, but I haven't run this test yet. So I can set up my configuration here to say run tests after build. So after I'm done building, my application build succeeded. It's going to go and run all of my tests automatically, and it comes up. Oh no, my test my test failed. And let me come over here so you can see it. Test failed. Let's scroll down and see what. Right message. Cert equal failure. Expected nine. Actually got zero. So right now we can do more testing. Now we can make the features of our calculator better by writing feature definitions, right? We can write our tests with methods like this and we can see our calculator is working or it isn't, right? And I can prove out that that is in fact how the calculator runs. I'll I'm running .NET run over here. So if I do, right, two plus three plus four, 
2 plus 3 plus 4. See, it's right, and and I can't I can't change that number. Do that one more time. 2 plus 3 plus 4. And that last one, it actually added on to the end of it. It didn't let me continue with the next operation. Right? So there's something there that isn't quite kosher, isn't quite in the right state. So if I go back, maybe on operator button click plus equals, maybe we shouldn't be clearing the current operation. Right? If we leave that current operation the way it is, right, and we don't and we don't set the buffer to zero, right? If we let the buffer equal the current value, then we can continue processing. We can move on. So maybe we move that, and if we change buffer and we say um, <laughs> um, right. Did uh, I should move this? Let's do this. Uh, underscore buffer equals, and I can get rid of all these two strings, and I can change this and say, right view screen display equals buffer to string. Um, zero. So now does that, how does that affect my unit tests, right? I just changed a whole bunch of logic. Well, I can rerun the tests and we can find out. I have to clear the buffer, really, in a calculator, only when you press that C button do you clear the buffer, right? I don't want to clear the buffer. Oh no, my build failed. Uh, what? That's a neat trick. Oh, it's still running over here. Stop that. So it still has my one failure, but now it got 59. Hmm. Hmm. Because it got five, and we didn't. What did we not do? Right? Two plus three plus four. So, current value, decimal parse, it's resetting it here of current operation. So we're not there. So view screen display, this, I can't believe I'm not, I, I'm not getting this working properly. Um, it's not JavaScript. Um, can I do some unit testing with Blazor? Oh, sure, we can do that. Um, so view screen display, um, is the current value. I w you're right, I want to clear, I, I want to show the output of that. And consequently, when you press the next button, I want to clear the value of it, right? Because you're, hang on, think this through. What, my goodness, why am I messing this up? Why am I not getting this straight in my head? I press 2 and it puts it on the display. I press plus and it clears the display. And it puts it into the buffer. So Why am I blind? Why am I not thinking this through? I'm I'm trying to juggle too many things here in my head. Um, you key in the value, press plus it, and 
it, it stores what the current operator is, puts that two in the buffer. You press three, it puts, and it, it has, and you pressed plus, plus equals. Well, it knows what the current operation is. So it's saying that equals, so it goes and does the plus, puts that value in the buffer. So now it has five in the buffer. So that it sets as the value as the value on the display, and I want to clear the operation at that point. So then when you press five, current operation is empty. No, when you press five, it's gonna it's not gonna clear the screen. It's like I want to clear. The, I want to change the button press so that if you just finished pressing equals, if you just finished, clear the screen. So let's go back up here. Right, it's adding on the value here. So let's put a boolean. Um, completed operation. right so if it's zero or completed operation and at this point we're done that and down here yeah completed operation equals true now let's see if that has it run my unit tests see if we got that last one am I clearing the display value well that's just it I need to clear the display value after you press it ah darn it nope went back to zero this should be a simple problem that I can solve and I'm not getting it right yes I do work at Microsoft how can I help Yeah, Microsoft did open source the the code to the Windows calculator. You can go and download that. Um, after you complete the operation, show the, the value that's... Right, so if we write all of my other tests where I'm doing just two values, it works just fine. And it clears out the operator at this point. Actually, no, I don't want to clear out the operator. I want to save the operator. I don't want that so that it continues it. But then I'm never right without a clear button. It's never going to go away, but I don't have a clear button. There we go. So now adding my three numbers works. So now I need a clear button, right? I need a clear button so I can clear the buffer and reset the operation and start working again. So let's create a clear button right here. And that's gonna do something else. So now we're introducing capabilities, writing unit tests, because we're defining, right? I mean, really what I should do here is create a test. Uh, a clear button reset uh and uh resets the screen um actually here's where i can do a, a given when then given uh two on screen when clear button pressed then the screen shows zero so let's do that same type thing arrange act assert so i'll copy this in so now stub view presenter those are defined so i'm going to press two and now i need a clear button clear button pressed i don't have a clear button pressed method yet we're going to write one and it should return to show zero 
right? So I need to create one of these. My presenter now has clear button pressed. If I run this test now, you see it's already showing me four tests there. If I run it, right, and here's the essence of test-driven development. I've defined the new feature as a test. I've written a, a, a failing test that tries to execute that. Given two on screen when clear button pressed and it raises an error, not implemented exception. I haven't written in yet. So test-driven development folks would say, now I go through and I'm gonna write that little bit of code that says view screen display equals zero. That's not the only thing the clear button should do, but that's the only thing that I have a requirement for it to do. So now when it runs, my presenter functions properly, four for four, my unit test passed. Now I need to go back over to my form and actually make this a clear button. So I'll change that so that, where's the text? Oh, right there. I'll change it so it has C on it for clear. And I'll go over to the events and it doesn't have an on click yet. And I'll just say presenter, clear button pressed. Once again, my form is dumb. I'm not, it doesn't, it isn't actually thinking. I'm handing off operation to the presenter. So, uh, design, how did I bring that? Uh, yeah, that sentence was horrible. <laughs> um, um, C, C, E, we could do that later, Surly Dev. I'm trying to make, I'm, I'm doing these simple um, here. We can get more sophisticated, certainly. Um, how did I bring up the design? If you double click on a Windows form, by default, it'll bring up the designer that you can interact with. If you right click on it, you can say view code or view designer, and it'll take me right into the C sharp code that goes with the Windows forms designer. So, um, great. So my screen display gets cleared when I press the clear button. Okay. Right. And I... I know that works. I'll run my Windows form over here. And okay, if I do the same thing, press two and hit clear, it resets it. But we know there's more to a clear button than just resetting it, right? We also want to clear the buffer. The bar, it shouldn't remember my current operation in these things. So how do I write a test that verifies that mm, reset it back to nothing? So really, this is when I would start writing that, that Gherkin Cucumber syntax. That's a, an open source framework that folks use for this uh, type of behavior driven development that we're getting into, where it's not just test driven, but we're using this, this um, nomenclature, this acceptable um, language around our features to define exactly how the requirements should behave. Given this scenario, when I do this thing, then I expect this result. And you see all of the requirements defined in this given when then syntax. So I, I you will see me do a lot here. Uh, not uh, wrong, wrong, wrong. I wanted a folder. I'll create folders named something like given um, something, right? Given um, value on screen. I'll create a class inside that. And this will be when clear button pressed, right? So I'll make this a public class. Now I'll go back over to unit test and where I had the really ugly name there and I did see the question DJ squared I'll I, I will where DJ squared's question come to I'm gonna pin that and I'll get back to that in just a minute this is it's not quite fluent 
Um, the fluent design is something different. Uh, this is more a test naming scheme. So I'll just do some control dot to get my using statements in here. There we go. So now when I run the tests, the test report becomes a little bit more Right, instead of just add three numbers, multiply three and three, sum two and two. Now, when you read the test, uh, let me rename that test method. Come here. Now it reads, um, oh, let me, there's one more configuration we can do here. Uh, do, 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 group by. I want folder in there. Namespace should be in there as well. Take project out. Yeah, namespace class. Why didn't it show, why isn't it showing the namespace? Oh, given value on screen. So, given value on screen, when clear button pressed, then the screen shows zero. So I can add other tests inside that same class that verify there's a value on the screen. These are the other things that I'm inspecting. And I can move some of this arrange and act elsewhere in the test, right? to make it reusable. So uh, I'm not gonna get into testing and building out clear any further because I do see that I am running low on time. Have I used flu fluent assertions before? Yes, I have. They're a little, um, they're a little confusing at times. Um, and I get what they're trying to do um, but I, I think it adds an extra layer of complexity on top of these that we don't really need. Um, because it, it, it does a lot with attributes, if I remember fluent assertions correctly. And, oh, oh no, no, wait, wait, um, that's something else. No, fluent assertions is, it has a bunch of English-like methods that, that do the tests instead of saying, um... Right, instead of saying assert equal, I forget, you could do is or is equal, and it, it is the name of the method, and it gets rid of the assert there altogether. Yeah, you can do that. Yeah, fluent validation, I think, is what I was thinking of. So, there's a lot that you can do with this. We've, we're just scratching the surface of this, but what I hope you're seeing is we're inspecting the interactions with the view when we interact with the presenter in the same ways that that the form uh, come on I want to view the code that the the form would now there's there's other tricks that folks play right with um, with this type of model where these event handlers here in WPF, you can actually wire these directly up to your presenter or your view model at that point. You expose directly into the markup, the view model object, and you declare, call this method when this button clicked. And it does that interaction. And we do something very similar with unit testing in Blazor as well and the unit test framework B unit that our friend Eagle Hansen built for Blazor. So you have a lot of options for how this works. You'll also see some folks with web forms and win forms uh, at times, instead of having the event handlers here, they'll actually define those event handlers inside the view so that you wire up your interactions to the, uh, the so that you're um, presenter 
is listening to the event handlers and the event handler this code is actually in the presenter instead of here in the form and this form becomes empty you can do that it's a little bit tricky but can be done um what i worry about at that point is some of these concepts that are very windows forms based start rolling into your um start rolling into your presenter code right um how much time do i have four minutes we can do this we can do this um so if i go find oh, are you kidding Uh, I calculator view, right? If I added here an event, uh, of course it's a public event, right? Zoom in a little bit there, right? I could add a uh, number button, uh, number button pressed, right? Come on, I need an event handler for this doesn't matter I'm going with the default event handler give me that using statement so now if I go back over to the form implement that right so now the event is right there number button pressed so I would actually um, hand off that to the presenter when that event happens. Why am I not thinking this through right? Because I want to say number button and go over there. I'm not doing this right. There's a there's a way to do this and I'm not doing this right. Um no, wait a sec. Hang on. Up in here, I could say... What are the number buttons? Back over here. Right, so... Right, like, that's button three. That is, yeah, button three. So I could do something like uh, button three dot on... On click. Oh, come on. Yeah, there it is. Right, and instead of calling button three click, right? Come here, you. Um, I, I can pass it right into presenter number button pressed. Right, so um, it's going to be a sender Right, and I can say that. And instead I can say button three dot text, or I could even just hard code it right there. And do I need a full parentheses around this? Or am I missing one? Yeah. There's a way to do this a little bit more functionally, and I'm not getting it quite right. Yeah, there it is, plus equals like that. So now, instead of having these method handlers down here, I just wire up the events right there, and it knows how to do the interaction. So your choice, you gotta declare it somewhere, but by placing it here, like this. Some folks like that because it's a little bit more declared versus um, letting it be over in the Windows Forms Designer. Your choice, how that interacts. We are out of time, friends. Oh my goodness. I spent way too much time talking about that. That was so much fun. Writing tests, getting it running. Um, so, my proper ar architecture senses are unconsciously... What? 
Surpassing my knowledge to put UI code in the presenter. Yeah. Yeah. So... But the idea is we've moved that UI code. We've made it um, as simple as possible so that it knows just how to interact with the user interface. And our business logic is over in another class, in another class library, where it can be tested and reused in other services. We can take that same class library now and move it into move it into a Xamarin or a .NET MAUI app so we have it in a mobile application in the future. Maybe move it into a service so it's now a web service. Your choice, all kinds of great things that you can do with that. And you now have that flexibility. You have that option available to you. Thank you so much, everybody, for tuning in. I know it went a little bit long. We lost everybody over on Learn TV. That's okay. Those of you that are watching on YouTube, hope you have a fantastic rest of your day. Happy coding to you. And those of you that are here on Twitch, let's set up a raid. Let's go connect with somebody else who's streaming on the big Twitch TV network. And uh, share some love. Check out some other folks that are out here streaming. And oh my gosh, I see a friend that I know we want to raid. Right off the bat, yeah, let's do this. Let's set up the raid. We're going to go see our friend, and she's a member of the .NET Foundation board. Let's go tune in to Layla Codes It. Thank you so much, friends, for joining me. Um... I will be back tomorrow over on my stream. We'll be working with Blazor. We'll be working on Azure and building cool things on Azure with Blazor. Um, hope you have a great rest of your day. I think if I saw my schedule right, I think we might have a game show here later this afternoon. We're going to bring, if I, if I read it correctly, we're going to have the Visual Studio community team game hour. And you're going to get to see some of your favorite hosts from the Visual Studio channel playing games against each other. So I hope you tune in. I'll be here. So that'll be a little bit later this afternoon in about two hours, I think. I'll be over on my channel tomorrow. Get ready to say hi to our friend Layla Codes It. And uh, I will see you then. Take care. <laughs>